And this is going to be episode two. Joining me today is going to be um, Jason Dilly. Is that correct? I butcher your name. Uh, yes, that's correct. Constantly, yeah. but okay. Um, Jason Dilly, Aaron, of course, from HCL, um, Sarah Young, and Joshua is it Knutson? Knutson. Knutson. Sorry, I butcher your names constantly. Nothing personal. Um, no worries. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, today we're going to be talking about. Um, a few topics we're going to be going through. Uh, we're going to be retouching on Title IX. I know we discussed it last week, uh, but we have some more people in here that may have a little more experience, a little different point of view for that topic, um, as well as Rocket League um, and E-League, um, some stuff with observing in esports, and we're going to basically get right into it. Uh, starting out with Title IX, um, I know we talked about it um, last week in last week's episode, um, but we basically touched very briefly on how the NCAA is now looking to possibly get into esports. We know the NAIA is already in esports with their subdivision NACE, and basically looking at what the only reason the NCAA hasn't come into esports at the moment is really the biggest thing is this Title IX, which um, the biggest drawback to this is the um, not being able to make any money as a college athlete, and stuff like that. So we really just want to go through that, break it down, and look at really what the NCAA would have to really do to be able to attract these students who could really say, you know, I don't want to play for this. If I can't monetize my live stream on Twitch, I can just go and join an ESEA team and go through that route. So um, does anybody have any thoughts on that, what you guys think on this topic, just starting out here? Anybody can just jump in, whatever. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the thing. If kids can figure out how to make money off of something they love, it's hard to, you know, convince them to do it for free as an athlete in high school or college. Um, they don't really have that opportunity as much with baseball or football or anything like that. But esports, there's a real opportunity because they have Twitch and they can get sponsored streams. They can, you know, uh, join an actual competitive team uh, outside of the school district. Um, so that's kind of a, a draw that doesn't happen in regular uh, student sports. Yeah, there's an independence there uh, where you really don't have to be affiliated uh, with anybody in order to be successful. Like any any high schooler um, with the proper equipment uh, can can load up a stream. And if that's all it takes and the NCAA is going to prevent somebody from doing that, like there's a, there's a big complication there um, uh, that really makes it so uh, a student may not want to do that if they're not planning on attending, <laughs> planning on attending a college. Yeah. I guess. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. You. Okay. Um. I guess you know. I I come from college esports. Uh. I'm a, a head coach at a university in North Dakota. We're a part of that subdivision in in the National Association of Collegiate Esports. Um. And and something that we're doing in in Jamestown is in regards to Title Nine. Um. And you you mentioned kind of like well they're losing out on that income. Uh, from not being able to stream if, you know, the NCAA were to get involved with this kind of thing. Um, you know, a lot of the member organizations that are part of NACE, and us included, we offer scholarships to come and be on the team just like traditional athletics. Um, so anybody that's on our, our roster receives that eSports scholarship, and that kind of can help offset that financial burden a little bit. Um, but it is, a, a, it's a really big problem because especially for the college space you know the top players in the world or you know in the country they're gonna say oh i can make all of this money you know continuing to stream or go pro or go to semi-pro teams or whatever that takes away from the talent pool that colleges are able to recruit from so it's kind of this interesting balancing act that we all have to kind of figure out what's best a for the student because that's who we should be caring about is you know how, how do we set up these 18 19 year olds for success in three or four years uh, hopefully that's with a college degree, um, but you know sometimes it's not not the direction that they're headed. Uh, so it's kind of how do we attract them to say, okay, if the NCAA puts this in 
this policy in place to not have them making money directly how can we offset that with scholarships or you know if we are playing in tournaments that are, there's a prize pool does that money go towards the the team itself and not directly the players and it's kind of like okay how can we offset that and how can we balance that to make the students happy and to kind of set them up for success yeah and also if we look if we if we think about having the NCAA go the other way and abolishing just not going with Title IX for specifically esports and forming a subdivision. Um, is that fair for the other student athletes that can't even monetize a YouTube channel like we talked about on the last episode? They can't even monetize a YouTube channel and they're like a baseball player or something like that. So is that fair to the other students who want to make some sort of income off of you know their publicity just like the esports athletes are? So that's kind of an issue I think the, w- the NCAA is struggling with as well. Yeah, it well, could think, open up a huge can of worms. Mm-hmm. And I think, like, if you look at the the NCAA's history, just with regular collegiate sports, um, there's been a lot of controversy in the last uh, 10, 15 years um, about that issue of allowing students to, um, to, to be monetized in that way. And esports is such a different beast. Uh, you know, when you look at the traditional, like, uh, amateur to pro uh, sequence, you see that uh, you college college football college baseball a lot of that is an essential step right that's where a lot of the pros are going to recruit those members but esports doesn't do that and they don't really need that i mean you look at a a pro league of legends player like keith uh who he he was doing his schoolwork during the week and then playing his lcs games on the weekend um, and he was he was one of the top ADCs. So, uh, like that transition between amateur to pro, how do you do that with esports? If you take that away, you're strongly disincentivizing players to play at a college level. Yeah, and I'm gonna keep referencing um, Counter Strike in this case, just because I know Counter Strike so much. Looking at leagues like ESEA, Sevo, Face It, it's unlike coming into college and going into pro. Like you don't have to touch college at the moment with esports to be able to go into it. You can look at ESCA, you can register a team for, I think it's like $7 per player for that league, and then you can even look at SEVO. They have a free division where if you really aren't sure if you can make it, you can go in there, and if you place first, you get a free bid into the next season, and you can work your way up with a pug team that you find just with people you play with online. And that's really the challenge they're going to have to get around also is that, hey, we can do this, we can work our way up to even if we get the premier level, the MDL, or even below that, some of these organizations that are picking these people up, these kids up, are paying them salaried um, contracts. They're giving them salary contracts. So, I mean, it's not much at a semi-pro level. I, I mean, I know a lot of them that we've seen, most of them are confidential, they'll um, really reach the public, but some of the salaries that I've seen for a college kid for playing a video game are up in the between a thousand and fifteen hundred dollars a month and you know that's not really uh something you can live off of in the long run but mm-hmm. as a college kid and as a not a barely semi-professional level that's not bad you know and beats mcdonald's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know i think part of the the whole conversation about you know going straight from high school to oh you know i can go to pro i think Part of that conversation has to be the fact that just the collegiate space isn't established to a point where it's attractive to 18 year olds yet. You know, I think uh, being a member of NACE and and seeing how these other schools like us are, are doing things, I think it's a great first step, but you know, the reason why NACE was put together was to kind of help the collegiate space get to a better point. Um, And I think it's, it's going to take some time, but I think, you know, in five or 10 years when every college in the country has some form of an esports team, I think we'll see things start to shift a little bit, but you're still going to have the kids who are 17 and signing pro contracts with the overwatch yeah. league and you know, stuff yeah. like that. So it's going to take time. And I think as the collegiate league kind of gets more established and kind of gets a, a little bit more structure and, and a little bit more respect from the community, I think that'll help with that transition. Um, but you know, it, it's kind of like the the NBA of the old times where you have kids that are 18 and go straight to pro is there's no incentive because I can make $50,000 next year playing for a pro team. Why would I go to get an education? And then when they retire, when they're 28, they're kind of, you know, they're in a bad spot because they don't have anything to fall back on. 
Um, so something mm-hmm. that I think really needs to be emphasized is there's an opportunity to play at a really high level in coming and playing on scholarship for a collegiate team and being able to play in kind of that same space to where you're playing at a high level against really good competition. You're getting a degree and you're setting yourself up for when you're 26, 27 and retire from professional because the space after, you know, when you retire from being a pro, you know, you can, you can stream. Yes. Uh, but you know, you're missing a lot of the, the, fallback plan i guess is what i'll call it um and i think as the collegiate space grows and gets better i think we'll start to alleviate that burden but you know it's it's going to take time yeah i think we're kind of seeing a shift in the industry as well especially with franchising starting to happen with the overwatch league and league of legends taking these huge momentous steps into setting up actual franchises i think we're going to start seeing a shift to maybe making these points happen like they have to be in college for at least one year before they can be recruited. They have to play on a actual college team to actually demonstrate some sort of skill that they're able to succeed outside of the home and in a, in a different environment because that will relate so much to being in like a gaming house and different things like that. So that would be overall beneficial to you know the franchising scene. I wonder if that's true, though, um, because the the thing that I would say is, is uniquely different about esports um, in comparison to traditional sports is that um, you know, recruiting in traditional sports can often be very time consuming, difficult and costly because you, you have to have uh, you've got people who who are traveling to interview and watch games. They're watching tape and and all of those kind of things. But in each one of these games, there's a built in recruiting tool, right? Like if you want to know who yeah. the top players in the, in the game are. Just check solo queue, right? Like if there's if you've got everybody in Challenger. Uh, on a list, like these are the top 50 players in the game and none of them are on a pro team, then you have to be asking yourself, well, why aren't they on the pro, the pro team? Like, mm-hmm. do we need the collegiate space in order to do the recruiting to the professionals? Because it's, like I said, it's a uniquely different beast than traditional sports. I, I, I think yes and no. I feel like there's a lot of people in solo queue that are really toxic, really angry players, and they don't have a space to be on a team, and that's overall really bad for the team and the team chemistry. Oh, I and totally esports agree is a mental game, 100%. And if you're not there mentally, your game is going to diminish well, really fast. That's 100% true. I mean, if you even look at the professional scene, uh, you look at, again, I'm going to reference Counter-Strike, that's really all I watch and follow uh, a lot, is you look at players like... Um, Simple from Navi and Freakazoid from Cloud9, they may not necessarily be an issue now, but if you look at when they first started to emerge in the pro scene, I mean, those two players specifically, more um, Simple than Freakazoid, they had a lot of issues with toxicity and that kind of stuff, and that's what actually led to Simple being um, not liked by a lot of people in Liquid. That was a big thing back when he was on there, when um, that was 2016, because I think ESL1 New York was his last tournament with them, but um, toxicity and really having that mindset to be able to play as a team and work with them is definitely important because that can lead very quickly to you being removed from rosters, especially in esports where you see these changes on teams just every few months. You really have to be in the mindset and performance that to be able to hold at that level or else you're going to be replaced relatively quickly. Um, and that's also yeah. something to look at what we talked about in the long run also. Um, if you go from amateur straight into pro you skip the college scene and you go into that team hoping you can make money there um again looking at esports with the professional scene if you look at tier three four five teams that aren't at the very top those rosters change every few months and a lot of those players end up being thrown back down into premier into main um again referencing freakazoid i believe he is now in a main team maybe a premier team so there is a very big risk in going straight into pro that could lend some that could really entice these kids to maybe go to the college scene where they would have the three, four years of experience to really build up their profile, show, hey, I'm able to compete on these teams at a competitive level. Let me, you know, be on your professional team and they'll also have that degree just in case. You know, I I can reference our team, you know, we're, I'm at practice right now. Actually, my team is in the other room. We've got a, our, our overwatch team is, we have a quarterfinal playoff game on Monday. So we're putting in a little bit of extra work tonight, 
but even like you know bringing in this is the first year that nace has had a, an actual you know concrete regular season i mean the league's only a year and a half old um but the development just in from august 28th when we had the first day of practice to you know this week when we were, were fighting for our playoff lives in the last game of the regular season you know the development and just the growth in three months of living together playing together every day and, and being in that same physical space with each other you know i've got a totally different six guys you know they're they're all the same six guys that we started with in in august but they're completely different people and players just because they've been able to have that interaction every single day live with each other and be put into that environment for three months and you you expand that over four years of getting or five years sometimes when you're getting a degree you know think of the the growth personally and you know the development as just a, a human being that can happen let alone a, a player playing at a high level against really really good competition um i think it it offers a really good space for for personal growth and and also just to get better at the game and be in those situations where you're on a stable team for more than just you know a couple months like you said and yeah, that actually brings into the thought of my mind of whether or not we're going to be seeing these college teams, these guys who have been playing together and living together for four or five years, if they're going to stick together after college and go into maybe being signed by a team in general, signed by an org, or starting up their own team, that's going to be interesting to see if these players who have been playing together for so long are going to go different paths, or if they're going to stick together and maybe find an org on their own or start one up. Um, that just popped in my end there. What do you think on that? Sure. Uh, you know, I think building chemistry is really important in esports. Uh, being able to to be in situations where you know exactly what the guy sitting next to you is gonna do. Um, and you know, if if you get in trouble during a game, you know, I'll use Overwatch for an example, just because you know we're in that season. Um, sorry, my Skype crashed. Um, but you know, we get into issues sometimes where you know we're playing Overwatch and the other team will switch to a Genji and we have a really hard time countering it. We know exactly that one of our guys is going to switch to Winston and help counter and dive. Um, and, and you know that doesn't happen with me calling out something or our team captain calling out something. We just know that it's going to happen um, because we've had three months to practice and run through those scenarios over and over and over again. Um, and I think that's uh, in any esport that's really, really valuable, uh, and I think translates really, really well. Well, and you see that in the League of Legends uh, pro scene as well. Uh, uh, what was it? I think it was uh, Rainover and um, and Huni when they came over to the the NALCS. They made mm -hmm. they came over together because as a top lane jungler combo, um, that that synergy was really important. Um, and uh, the the mental aspect of the game uh, and that growth, you're also finding on those leagues that they're they're hiring uh, professional psychologists and team components to to have these guys come in there and help them uh, grow and learn together. So it's it's an important space and thing to develop for them. Yeah, I'm gonna bring it back to the NCAA a little bit. So if I say say that I'm a, I'm a director of the NCAA board. Right, um, and I'm looking at esports right now, and I'm thinking about what can we do to help this scene, and how can we do that so we don't impact our traditional sports aspect. Um, I could probably see it as an issue that esports hasn't grown enough for us to take action and to mitigate Title IX and stuff like that, because they could see it as a way, like they could see esports just like traditional sports. It needs to grow to that point that they have to go through college, and therefore we can force that Title IX. What do you guys think about that? Ooh. Stumper. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, what do what do you mean by growth? Are you saying like? Popularity, well, grow like most watched, uh, because there's a lot of there's a lot of evidence out there that we can bring in viewers, uh, people who are interested in watching these kind of games. Yeah, yeah. I'm not too concerned about viewership. What I'm concerned about is the infrastructure. So now we're just starting to see traditional franchises s sprouting up, like the Overwatch League, um, the 2K League, and also the uh, the League of Legends franchising. They want to see a, a sort of structure in the pro scene. So they have a sort of value, if you know what I mean, like as a college, as a recruitment pi pipeline and stuff. Because right now it's not there. Kids 
just go right on into the pro scene. And there's no value for them to be offering scholarships and stuff like that because they just might they just might up and leave really quickly, which already happens anyways with traditional sports. But at least they have them for a year. They have to go through college. But that also comes back to the high school's uh, support with the, the path to college. Because yeah. speaking as a high school uh, teacher, I know that's one thing with schools right now is that you you aren't necessarily always promoting a four-year path through college after high school. So you're promoting other ways for them to be successful Um that don't necessarily go through a four year path through college. So that may be hindering a little bit in the college recruitment when you, when that's the message now, you know, you don't necessarily have to go to a four year. You maybe are better fit for a two year or a trade school, or uh, maybe you have the talent to uh, be on a profession on your, or go through a profession on your own that doesn't necessarily require a degree. Um, so that may be hindering as far as a recruitment into college as well is how they're, um, how the high school is kind of molding them for their, you know, exit. Um, yeah, it's not it's not seen as like a viable option to go into esports at a college institution institution yet. So they're seeing like, oh, I can make money as a Twitch streamer. Oh, I can be on YouTube. I can do all these other yeah. avenues they to see get that. money. Because this is what I'm yeah. passionate about. I think yeah. the yeah. just as speaking as a college student myself, I think the real what's going to get these kids in is seeing these scholarships that are saying, hey, you know, I may want this. I'm good enough to potentially be on these pro teams, but if you're going to give me a scholarship that can help pay for my school, I'm going to be able to afford and go get a degree. And if I want to, say, go into a a field of business or IT or something like that, I can do that, and it's not going to put me into a as ridiculous amount of debt. Yeah, because that's why they preach you know, not necessarily a four year, because for some families that taking on that debt is not um, something they can, you know, do. So, you know, having recruitment for some of those kids who would love to go to college and have a talent to get them a scholarship um, and something non-traditional like the esports. And I think it really depends on like, what is this, what is the student's overall goals in their, in their path? Um, if you have a student who happens to be very good at a at a game, um, they might be looking to they they want to go to college, but they don't want to play uh, League of Legends or Overwatch professionally. Um, the that just might be a way to pay for college, and you're going to get some kids that will will go into that to just strictly for the scholarship portion. Um, but then uh, I think to go back to kind of the original question was um, do if we're not seeing the the colleges as that pipeline to the pros uh, because of uh, the lack of that infrastructure in the pro scene, Mm -hmm. um, those students, the college doesn't mean anything to them because they don't need a scholarship money. If their end goal is getting into the pro scene, they don't need to take the college step, right? It's good for their backup and I think good for their personal growth and that's probably what they should do. But if overall goal is pro scene, uh, I mean, that could be a sidestep, a distraction, something that, that keeps them from that is if they can go straight from the game to the, to the pros. Yeah, and especially looking at the age and the fall off of these pros right now, it really is around the 18 to 25 year old range where these kids were seeing these professional players at their peak. You're really seeing very rarely you see with professional players staying up on top when they get past. 25 into like the 30s i mean the only examples i can think of is virtus pro um in counter-strike um other than that most of these professional players are between the 18 and 25 age range so that is there's a few of them in league of legends scara and reginald and i think tyrus was up there too before but i mean they just recently retired and i think they were in their their upper 20s I think we'll see a, a shift of that age, you know, just with the generation that's coming up right now. I think we're going to have a lot more 30-year-old gamers, you know, in the next 10 years. Um, and I think we'll, we'll start to see that age shift a little bit um, to where maybe like 30 is the, is the common time when they're, re- when they're retiring from the pro scene or something like that. Um, but I think just from the collegiate standpoint, we just have to do a really good job of explaining options to these kids when we're going into high schools and trying to recruit and saying, hey, you know, this is an option for you to have this fallback plan, even if you are one of the top 500 players. You know, it, 
this will only help you be better when you get to the age of 22 when you're ready for you know that next step and i think you know for our program specifically my goal is not to make every single one of my players turn pro my goal is to make sure that they graduate in four years and are set up for after after college yeah. you know yeah. we we're going to have a recruit coming in next year that very well could go pro um but that's not my goal is not to get him to the pro scene it's to say hey you know i'm gonna make sure that you're set up for later in life and you have a degree that means something and i think if colleges take that mindset i think that'll help a lot with kind of the state of things right now exactly okay i'm gonna interject really quickly sorry um so we are doing a giveaway right now um the keyword in the twitch chat is hsel homeroom again that's hsel homeroom and if you have any questions whatsoever you can tweet us uh, the hashtag uh, HSEL homeroom as well. Um, we do have one question. Go ahead, Elijah. What's the question? Pookie Panda asks, what about parents who don't support playing video games whatsoever? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll take that one. <laughs> uh, our program's new at our school. Um, and it's we started it last year, and this is our first like real year of putting like we're going to do this last year we kind of tinkered around a little bit but this year it's been uh we've worked really hard to make ourselves legit um with that however we've had run-ins with parents on uh for instance uh csgo has come up as far as um the, you know, it being a first person shooter game. Um, and we were able to navigate that argument pretty well at the high school level of the, we don't buy the game. The kids come in already having the games. Uh, their parents are supportive um, and so forth. But as far as the parents being supportive of e going into esports as a pro on a professional level, um, I, it, that's a hard sell because it's, it's a hard sell if you're a baseball player and, um, you know, a parent saying, you know, my kid's going to go pro because you want them to also be able to make a living if that doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, so that's where colleges are great on the recruiting part because that's our sell to parents. This is now a scholarship program. This is something your kids can get to school on. Um, they, there's a chance. There's a college 30 minutes from us that offers eSports scholarships. So we don't focus on the whole going pro um, and the kids – I don't hear that a lot from my kids. I hear them looking at maybe being able to go to college with this and having a scholarship. So yeah, it's a hard sell to a parent to say, hey, I want to be a professional gamer. <laughs> yeah, and I know it's a, that's... It's a, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I know that's just a lot. I mean, this I'm a freshman um, up at um, school right now, but I know that with my parents was very like... I, I played a lot. I, I tried playing competitively in Counter-Strike for a little bit. I was never nearly good enough to be able to get up to the level I wanted to be. So I ended up um, going through coaching, managing, and I eventually landed here. And they really didn't accept that it would be a viable option until I really started uh, working with HCL <clears throat> and having that option where I could make a career out of it. Um, so that's really what, yeah. And I think for some kids, that exposure to pro gaming as an option is when they get to college for me and my area at least because mm -hmm. they don't i mean we're rural we're out in the middle of missouri in the middle of nowhere um so having a college that supports esports and gaming you know that's probably if they wanted to go pro that would be you know kind of their sell to the parents hey i can get a scholarship to you know the college in the next town by you know, going to esports, and then maybe I can try something professional or make work talking, my way up. We're talking about a big cultural shift, too. I mean, you've got like in, in the way that the video game market has changed in the last 25 years. I mean, it used to be a very like niche, nerdy thing that very few people were a part of, and now it's a multi billion dollar industry. It's, uh, it's meaning like pop culture and uh you know that that shift i think is going to be a big play into those parents because when parents that when the parents of teenagers were growing up it <laughs> wasn't a thing like this is brand new and the the possibilities with it are brand new uh, this is all stuff that we're kind of like navigating together and uh i think with parents who didn't really grow up gaming 
they wouldn't understand that, right? Like, yeah. how can you understand that when you yeah. there's no there's no culture on it like built up for them? Uh, and so I think as as those things become more mainstream, uh, and I think like um, uh, J- I think it was uh, Joshua was saying earlier, uh, you know, as the the pro scene changes around and we start to see like more legitimate franchises coming together um, and it hitting those mainstream topics, that is going to be a shift for for parents that um, being uh, them being able to see their son or daughter in um, a high school league being very successful, well. Okay, that might actually be a way to to move forward and make that a little, you know, a legitimate choice for them. And it's also for parents too. It's not something uh, for like if your kid plays football or baseball, you can go to that game on Friday night and see it and see them playing. Uh, for some parents, I mean, it's hard to sit there and stare behind your kid as they're playing CS:GO or Overwatch. And I know for me, for my kids that play, or for my my team that plays uh, in the league, um, it's just me and them in a lab, a computer yeah. lab. And that's, I mean, parents don't really come in and watch. They could, but it's it's hard for them to grasp the concept when there's not like a cheering crowd or yeah. something like that going yeah. on. For my students, I have my, um, I have our, Cedar Woolley has our esports page and I and I do the casting for all of our games and I have had like two different parents who come on and watch our streams and cheer on their kids. Like we had one game where um, one of the, the key reasons why we won the game was this person's kid and like in the chat they're just going that's my boy my <laughs> oh, and like it was fantastic <laughs> i love that so yeah, and that's, that's um great. that's part of the reason that we have this i mean we try to stream as many kids as we can unfortunately we only have so many staff and so many people to be able to mm-hmm. do the casting i mean i myself do the casting for most of the counter strike games and stuff like that but we also have the option for these schools to set up these Twitch channels, and we have that direct partnership with Twitch to help these schools get that ability to, you know, broadcast their games themselves if they really want to, or broadcast this content <clears throat> themselves, uh, and really have these parents be able to look at this content so the kids can be like, hey, like this is a real thing, this is what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not just an excuse to play video games. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is a good excuse, though. <laughs> it's very good. It's very good. Um, we have another question from Twitter. Uh, go ahead, Elijah. So Pookie Panda asks again, or really, it's uh, it's more of a statement, but I think uh, they want it uh, answered. Uh, my dad doesn't support playing. I don't want to go pro, but I really want the scholarship so I can go to college. But my dad's overly focused on grades. I guess the question there would be something that they could tell their dad to help them understand that this is a good path. So I, I think I can answer this one. Um, you know, in recruiting for our team, you know, we've kind of run into sometimes we have parents who are a little bit more skeptical than others. Uh, for the most part, all of my players' parents are awesome. They, you know, watch us on Twitch all the time and they bought jerseys and all that stuff. Um, but one of the things that I always really kind of push when I talk to parents, especially when we're recruiting, is that the students are getting more out of you know playing for us than just playing video games you know there's that aspect of team building and communication skills that are being developed um and there's a lot of personal growth that comes from being on a team like this um just because it's not football or baseball or basketball you know you're still getting elements of those sports in esports um and then you know to to kind of hit on the importance of grades um you know, a lot of schools uh, have eligibility requirements that student athletes have to meet. Um, we here in Jamestown, we put a policy together for our team developed with the help of our student athletes of saying, you know, if you're at a certain grade, you know, you're not starting, you have to get that grade up. Um, and it's actually a contract that all of our players signed. And it's kind of, we call it our academic accountability policy um that if you know if you have a c or a d or an f and stuff you're meeting with tutors you're meeting with professors and working towards getting your grade up um because the the nai and and 
our school in general, if you fail a class, you're put on academic probation and then you're not allowed to participate. Uh, and we rolled that into our program here, you know, in the same vein. So if, if academics are kind of the thing that, you know, your parents are really worried about, you can say, Hey, a lot of these schools are really focused on making sure that we're academically sound as well as playing on the team. Um, and I think, you, you know, uh, you'll find that almost all colleges kind of have that mentality of we want our students to succeed in the classroom because, you know, they need to stay eligible. Um, and if you're eligible, you're able to play. And if you're not eligible, you know, you're going to have to get those grades up before you can participate. Yeah. Yeah. It's Start by rules. focus on your uh, grades. Yeah. You have to have a passing GPA to be able to participate in HSEL. Yeah. And I, in, so for my program at our high school, uh, the, I have something similar. Uh, the, it, it's 2.0 for HSEL. Um, from what I've told my kids is you can't have anything below a C because, uh, and if they do, um, then, uh, I report them. <laughs> uh, we have a we have a unique lunch thing at our school where um, we do an hour long lunch where there's a half an hour for kids to eat and then a half an hour for kids to have some kind of intervention time. And um, what I've told my kids is that my lab is open for practice as long as you have C's or above in all your classes. And so um, my esports players come in for that half hour during lunch. Sometimes they come in for the whole hour and they just eat their lunch in there. Um, but every time they come in every day, I check their grades. Um, and if I see anything that's uh, below a C, I, I kick them out. I tell them you need to go see this teacher. Uh, grades need to be the number one thing. Like if that's what your parents are saying is important that you need to show, then you need to show that first and say, listen, I can do the esports thing and keep my grades where you want them to be. And if at any time they drop, well, then you've got like that's if that's what your parents want, then you need to make sure that that that's what you're giving them. Exactly. All right, well, I think that's going to pretty much cover everything with the Title IX, unless anybody else has anything um, to cover there. Um, but the next thing we we're going to look at is going to be moving on from the college and high school level space. And we're actually going to be looking uh, more at the professional scene and the growth of esports in general. Is going to be Rocket League added to E-League. Um, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot to talk about here, but um, yeah, basically TBS is adding E-League into their or e -League, Rocket League into E-League, which is their televised um, tournament, um, famous for the Counter-Strike right now, I believe it was almost every season, except the last one I was Street Fighter, I want to say. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a $150,000 prize pool, nothing as big as the million-dollar um, Counter-Strike, but still a decent prize pool here. Split up between less players. Yes, well, yeah, yeah. that's true, less players <laughs> to split up. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's a good step. Uh, I feel that it's good that we're kind of breaking out of violence uh, in video games. Even that, That's kind of like the core base of all video mm -hmm. games. I, like, the way that I like to think of esports, it's an action film. But it changes every time. That's what makes it interesting. Uh, we'll touch on what makes an esport an esport later on in this discussion. But um, um, I, I think it's good that we're kind of moving away and we're kind of looking at sports games in general. And I'm really glad that Rocket League has had the success that they've had. Uh, without having to incorporate violence and it's got a viewership it's got a spectatorship and it's a really competitive game and kind of, it's really fun to watch too it takes a lot of skill yeah. if you haven't played rocket league it's it's really hard to get those aerials and stuff like that but um, it's my favorite game that i'm terrible at yeah exactly exactly <laughs> everybody's terrible at it except the ones that are pro and you kind of just <laughs> drop your jaw but that's what interests me about it personally and i i really like the game as well yeah and i think this is definitely Definitely a good step for esports when we're trying to branch out into the mainstream. So getting on TV, getting the support of mm -hmm. the general public, because now we're saying, hey, it's not all about shooting people. Um, as much as I love Counter-Strike, don't get me wrong, it's my favorite esport by far. Uh, but bringing Rocket League and games like this into the mix where you don't have the violence is a way to show, especially to these parents, like, hey, like this is not all esports is about. It's really about the competition. It's not just you know shoot them up it's not all violence so this is definitely i think in my opinion a good way to start pushing into the mainstream even more than we already are and it's well, so it, go ahead go ahead sorry oh i was gonna say along the lines of that and the question earlier with the parents parental support with esports i know when we were going through our thing with csgo we had brought up rocket league because it was 
uh, one of the uh, options for us to do in the league that wasn't a first person shooter. So if a kid still wanted to go into it, but the parent didn't want them to be in a first person shooter type game, Rocket League was an option. And so was Hearthstone. Um, so, you know, for for me as a with the high school league, it's it's great to have an option for those kids who still want to participate, but maybe their parents don't want them to play a first person shooter. Exactly. So it's neat to see it on TV because then they can show their parents. Yeah. Exactly. Any mainstream exposure is good exposure, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Positive mainstream exposure. <laughs> yeah. 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 As long it's... as you're not getting in trouble for doing stuff, I mean, any exposure other than that is good. Pretty much. Yeah. And it, and it's it's so easy to understand too. If you know soccer, you can definitely understand this. And it's kind of got. It's got like the whole overview of the field. You can see what's going on at all times. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of it makes it really simplified and anyone can consume it really. You don't really have to play the game at all or have any existing knowledge to understand what's going on. It's and very even, TV friendly. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it, the, yeah. the, what I love about Rocket League is it's an it's amazing to watch because it even for those low if you're not familiar with it, it's fun and interesting. It's a fun and interesting concept. And if you're kind of a low-level player like me, watching the pros is like an awe-inspiring experience because I have no idea how they manage to like actually hit the ball doing those aerial stunts. Like, well, you... <laughs> I love watching it because it's it's so much beyond what I can do. <laughs> well, even watching some of these kids in the high school league, I mean, I don't normally do much with the uh, Rocket League stuff, but I broadcasted i believe it was last week's rocket league game and even these some of these kids at the high school level are just doing stuff that i couldn't even yeah. imagine I, I can drive forward i can jump up sometimes i can hit the ball in a general direction these kids are flying up hitting it to each other midair slamming it like i don't know how these kids do it and yeah it's some of these kids are just ridiculous it's it's amazing to watch really um and that really makes me question how the viewership on, on TV is going to be with this, because I know Counter-Strike was fantastic um, just because of really how big the scene already was, how action-packed and fast-paced it is. Um, mm -hmm. They did Street Fighter. The ratings weren't nearly as good as Counter-Strike, but I do think it's because with a game like Street Fighter, you really have to be in that community to yeah. really understand what's going on and really like to watch it because it's very slow paced nothing's really going quickly and when you look at a game like rocket league and counter-strike they're fast paced and you really don't need to know much about the game to know what's going on so looking at rocket league can be really interesting to see what the viewership numbers are uh, for e-league specifically mm -hmm. definitely and again i'm going to touch upon that we're going into sports game now sports games going into the mainstream for esports i think that's awesome and i really I'm looking forward to seeing what 2K does with the NBA two or the NBA rather is what they're doing with the 2K league. I think that's going to be great. And if they start opening up their matchmaking a bit more and making all these other improvements to NBA 2K to make it more esports friendly, I feel like that will be the next big thing behind Rocket League as a sports game in esports. Um, once yeah. they create that market demand and train their user base that they're a competitive game and push that game mode, um, we'll see a lot of growth in the sports area. Yeah, and I'm interested to see, I mean, this is kind of going to transition us sort of into our next topic uh, with the Red Bull article, but I'm interested to see how the, the sports game uh, Steep is going to do, because I know, uh, if you guys haven't seen already, the um, Olympics are going to be running an IEM event uh, leading up to the, um, the Pyeongchang um, Olympic Games, and that's going to be running StarCraft Two and the... Um, was it the Ubisoft game Steep, which is officially licensed to the Olympics uh, Winter Games? Um, but the interesting thing about that is, yeah, it's a sports game, but it's single player. So at the mo at the state it's in right now, if you download that game now, there's no multiplayer. Um, mm -hmm. So it's going to be really interesting to see how they run that and how they're going to be able to do that. Um, again, we touched on this in the previous episode um, on the big stage, and that's really going to lead us into this next um, topic. Here is the Red Bull and the spectating, and what really makes it the sport, the eSport, um, fun to watch. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of questioning Steep as the choice of game for IEM, especially StarCraft as well. But, I mean, it's Korea. That's their market. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a dying brand almost. I think they're trying to revitalize it, making it free-to-play that they just announced on BlizzCon. 
um, they're trying to draw some more community in there and get people hooked on the game, but I don't know if it really has the place anymore because it's a single-player game, and it's all about reacting to what the other opponent does. It's not really... It's not really... It's not really like we have esports titles today where it's team based. You have to work as a team and also respond to the enemy team and organize your own strategies and orchestrating stuff like that. So I don't know if StarCraft really has a space space in the current esports industry right now. Um, I mean, at least yeah. with that game, it does have a scene. It does have current professional players. Yeah, that's what true. What I'm really worried about yeah. is Steep. Is it's a new game. There's no professional scene at the moment. It's single player. And the question is going to be, who's really going to be playing in that? How are they going to set this up on a main stage? How are they going to broadcast it and set it up in a way that it's going to be, one, competitive, and two, fun for people to watch and enjoyable for people to follow and really, you know, enjoy? Because um, at the moment, the, the only way I can think of it is having one or two, you know, a few setups up on stage and these players doing their run, say, you know, they're doing time trial skiing. They're going down their hill. They do their run. And then they get up. Somebody else sits down. They do it. So it's going to be really interesting to see how they're able to do this on a main stage, especially with the game being single player and no option for any sort of multiplayer. Yeah, and I wonder if they just chose it because it's the one that relates to winter the most. You know what I mean? Like, well, I, is that is that the spot for it? Well, I know it's, it's, a, it's officially licensed to the Olympics, so that is a big thing that they're doing. And since they are partnering with the um, Olympic Committee uh, for the Pyeongchang IEM, I think that's a really big thing onto why they're doing it. But mm -hmm. the question I'm having is who's going to play and how are they going to set this up because there's nothing around the game right now. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. That's something that that's a question for the developers. I, I mean, I'd hope they would have some sort of spectator option, just like every other esports game out there, with um, some sort of controls, and it's not just viewing down, you know, the person's shoulder in game, just capturing whatever they're playing. I don't think that's very right. And there, like you said, there's no multiplayer. So are they just doing individual time trials on whatever event it is, like downhill skiing or something like that? I don't know. But hopefully there'd be some sort of head-to-head -head feature or something that they can integrate for this event. They have a little bit of time to get something going. I mean, they could pro they probably already have something on the back burner that they're implementing for this event. But I don't know. I, I, I think that they're doing this because it's specific to the Olympics and it'll help get the Olympic brand out there to promote the Olympics in the esports scene. Because they probably don't have a lot of viewership there. People are watching Worlds and stuff like that, not really the olympics so yeah it, it for me it almost seems uh with that specific game like a like a publicity stunt you know uh which mm -hmm. i would hate to see the the competitive esports market uh, be subjected to that uh because i think there's there's a lot more possibilities for it than than what can happen and it's it's i don't know I hate to be negative, yeah, but I, it feels like trying to cash in on some some popularity of something. And, yeah, I'm on yeah. the same same page as you right now. Um, if I could put any positive to that, uh, it could potentially be IEM and ESL trying to get their hand in the Olympics. Because um, I know LA was looking to possibly add esports into the Olympics, either as an upcoming event, a, an event following, or in between during the Olympics, um, bringing some esports into it. So it's, mm -hmm. I'm really questioning if this is a stunt to really do a test run to see what the popularity is going to be with esports. Um, I don't know. It's, it's hard to really tell, but this could really be a test run to see how an esports competition leading up to or during an Olympic Games would mm -hmm. fare. And they are talking about doing different esports for the Paris Olympics in 2024 as well. So I can see yeah. that. I could understand that. Mm-hmm. I just don't question um, the... Doesn't seem like the right place to start, though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, quick shout-out. We're doing another giveaway in the chat. So, again, the same keyword, HSEL Homeroom. Again, that's HSEL Homeroom, and you get a free varsity code for a free month subscription. So, uh, yeah. Pop that in the chat, and we'll be giving one away shortly. Um, do we want to move on to the next topic, then? Yeah, I mean, I think that really... Sure. That conversation transitions us really into the what we have in the Red Bull article is what really allows an eSport to be fun to watch. What do you really have to do to have this game that's fun to watch? I mean, you have all 
thousands, probably close to millions at this point, millions of games out there that Mm -hmm. have potentially a competitive landscape, but you really don't see a lot of viewership for these games. I mean, you have Counter-Strike, you have League of Legends, Overwatch, Rocket League, these games where ESL and all these other organizers have found the way to make these games entertaining. Um, And you you look at stuff like PUBG that are coming up, they're able to make these um, live streams and these live events fun to watch because of the way they're able to produce it. So what do you really have to do to make games um, really fun to watch, esports fun to watch and enjoyable for viewers? Those are no really new thoughts on that. I mean, I feel like community is huge. Uh, you the When you have a really large community uh, that plays and enjoys the game and then you make the, the tools available for it uh, to be watched well, uh, then you end up with something that's going to be a little bit more popular. I mean, one of the things that they stated in the article is that you... The, that entry point for people, right? Uh, how complicated is the game? Uh, something like League of Legends, you know, I, I started playing League of Legends because I was at PAX West one year and I sat in a line uh, for like an hour and a half where they had the um, NALCS championships uh, going on on big screens all around us. And I've never heard of or played League of Legends before, but being in an audience where people were getting excited and screaming out uh, about the games really got me curious. And even though I sat there uh, knowing absolutely nothing about what was going on, I still enjoyed the experience. Um, and I, I think that like y- y- that entry point for something like League uh, I'm I'm different than normal people who are going to be watching something, right? Non-gamers are going to have no idea what's going on and then have no interest in going and playing it, and you've just you've lost a viewer. Well, that's something that, I mean, touching on that again, being in the arena versus online, I mean, I go to events when I can. I've been to both ESL1 New York, and I just bought my tickets for the E-League Major um, in Boston. And just my having friends who don't really know much about esports um, who were always just – you know, they play lacrosse, football, um, all that stuff. They look at this the online competitions. I'd be watching some at school if I have free time, and they wouldn't really understand why I'm watching it. And then, you know, they'll see these pictures and they'll see these videos that I'll post on Snapchat or I'll show them of these stadiums. And there, it's mm-hmm. really a moment of like, whoa! Like people could actually like <laughs> they're filling the Barclays Center, they're filling mm-hmm. massive arenas with these people, and it is hyped up. And there's like that actually looks really fun and enjoyable to watch. So that's really a big thing of in person versus online. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a big I, thing there. I'd have to say, I like for me, this is uh, you know the games that my team plays are you know fairly new to me. I'm an old World of Warcraft <laughs> girl, and so <laughs> honestly, the you know this was it my deal before I was you know I'm. Um, old so world of warcraft i grew up with that and that's my thing and um you know that's pretty isolated type game i mean of course you can watch it and uh play and view but to watch these kids play their games and get excited and be there while they're doing it and i'm sure it's even more amplified in the arena type um uh venue I, I mean, you do. You get into it. I mean, it is. It be, I can see where it's a spectator sport. You feel their excitement. You are rooting for them. You're watching it on screen. When I first started watching these guys play, no idea what they were doing. But as I started watching them more, getting into it, watching more online and so forth, I'm into it now. I, I love watching it. I love watching them. I, and, uh, you know, it'd be great to watch at one of the bigger venues like you were talking because I think, you know, it has to be pretty fun to be in that room um but it's it's a feeling you don't get necessarily just by watching them online and not being in the room with the players yeah and even just having just knowing the crowds there and seeing the crowd get excited is really what i feel like draws a lot of people in because i know um again for personal experience uh, when they televised the e-league major that was the first um counter-strike major that they had ever televised in the united states i think that was actually the second tournament because the e-league regular season was first um the first major that they've broadcasted in the u.s so i had it on in our living room and my grandfather would actually come come and sit down and before that you know being he he's always grew up with no internet nothing like that he's like oh that's like stupid you should be going outside that sort of stuff that sort of mindset 
Um, he actually sat down and started watching it, and he found interest in it. Um, just seeing all these people in the arena and all these people getting hyped over it, and when he saw how much these players could actually be making, that's where the interest really came from, having the combination of all that in one, on one screen or one arena. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think having a player base, like having people play the game as well, because a lot of people watch football, but they don't actually play football. They've never played football. They might have never <laughs> even thrown a football. I feel like that adds a huge connection to the sport as well. Yeah. And I, I went to Worlds uh, last year, the group stages, um, when they're in San Francisco. That was one of the first esports events I've ever been to. I haven't been to an event like that ever. It was like the most electrified, energetic experience ever. Everyone was rooting Team USA when Cloud9 was playing because they're the last ones up um, on the last day of the group stages. Um, it, it was just a completely different experience. And I've, I've seen the San Francisco Giants when they you know, were on their playoff runs. I've been to Warriors games. I've been to 49ers games. It's not the same at all. It's a completely different experience. And it's a really energetic atmosphere. And I feel like if an eSport can make it so... Well, the barrier to entry is... is is a good thing to keep that low but having it accessible to everybody makes it even more popular and awesome of an yeah. experience and that's why i laugh yeah. whenever people try to make the argument against esports like oh why why, why, why do you like, yeah. why would you want to watch it you could just go play and i'm just like you, you okay you just watched the um the fucking like the football game last night Pardon, like, sorry about that. um that's my bad um you know they're they're watching the football game last night and i don't see you outside playing the game you don't play football you're not doing any of that so i laugh at that when they argue that's like mm -hmm. their only argument it's like oh you could be you, know, you could be going and playing the game right now like why why aren't you it's why aren't you playing football why aren't you playing baseball um it's fun to watch we're not at that level not necessarily able to compete at that level and like yeah but i mean that's why yeah. twitch and that is so popular uh over the past exactly. five years is that you know it gives us the access to watch pros like i love i love playing all of these games i love hearthstone but you know i know that i'm i'm never going to be a, a legendary player but the fact that i can get on and watch other legendary players in something that i love and enjoy uh i mean that's a big sell and uh so if, you know for the people who are already in it um it makes sense uh, yeah. that there would be that there uh it's you know you, making that argument for non-gamers i think is going to be a lot harder like w the growth outside of the gaming industry those people who are not constantly playing these games uh, that's that's the hard part i think in this audience is like how do you reach those people how do you make it interesting to them how do you make them understand it because uh i think pro sports uh right you know normal sports uh, like watching a football game makes more sense than watching something in Counter Strike or Hearthstone. Yeah. yeah so, uh, if that's all the thoughts there, I think we'll move on um, really to the last thing we wanted to discuss here is um, you know, we have all these games, and it sort of comes from the discussion we just had about the what makes it fun to watch is what really makes in eSport and eSport. I mean, we have, again, thousands, millions of games out there. What really makes takes a game and makes an eSport instead of, you know, having just a competitive game mode, what makes it, like, defines it as an eSport here? I think at the very base level, I think sustainability is a huge thing. You know, mm -hmm. when you look at, at games like mm -hmm. Counter-Strike came out in the 90s, you know, and it's still played by you know thousands of people and and you know has this great following and this great support system and you have other games that have been around for a while like league of legends that you know it's stuck around mm -hmm. um and i think you know when when people ask us like well why don't you have a call of duty team here at the college and i'm like well call of duty yeah well it has its own pro scene you know when a new game comes out every nine months it totally changes the way that you coach the game, that you play the game. Yeah. You know, at its very core level, I think esports need to be sustainable, and they need to, you know, have a good base to to keep following and, and to build off of. And and the developers of the actual, you know, the the esports that are thriving right now have kind of understood that, and they've mm -hmm. taken a really good game at its base, and they haven't changed it a whole lot, but they've made it better as it goes along. And I think that that at its at the very you know, root of the question of what what makes an esport an esport, I think you know, sustainability is something that 
we look at, you know, as, as I think one of the most important things. Yeah, and I know even as a tournament organizer for HSEL, we get that question every single day, um, a lot through our support uh, client, or we'll get stuff in Discord, where people are asking, well, why don't you have this game? Can you add this game? It's like, well, like, first we need to see that people want the game, and then, you know, we really need to be able to run this game and not have it die off in a year, and that's what a lot of people really don't understand that when uh, joining these leagues is, like, we <laughs> we have to be able to sustain it, so, you know, a lot of these games that have very short lifespans are not going to survive as an eSport. Yeah, so. I think the ease of watching, too. Like, can the developer make it easy to, well, one, to have, like, a spectator mode. Spectator mode is necessary and analytical tools to dive into the details and the core reasons why a team is winning, what what makes what makes it yeah. that they're winning, and kind of um, make it interesting to watch for someone. That makes sense. Um, and also that competitive edge it needs a really really fine-tuned competitive edge that's balanced but um really balanced but fun really fun to play and you know you can abuse different things that can kind of work out in certain situations but not all the time like timo jungle or something like that you know fun (laughs) different things like that but um it really needs to be competitive and have a competitive core base like league of legends hearthstone and csgo they have competitive modes that drive the game like you play CSGO to play the competitive side. They don't have any other game mode that's like that competitive side. And that's what's played in the pro scene. League of Legends, there's a huge rank system, and everybody wants to play rank to get those get those season rewards. Hearthstone, there's a rank system as well. Rocket League, there's a rank system as well. And all these other games that are trying to be pro, they don't have a competitive edge to that to them, like Call of Duty. They, yeah. We're starting to see a ranked system come out for Call of Duty with World War II. That might be interesting to see. I don't know, but again... Like Josh mentioned, they're on that they're on that developer cycle, and that's really hard for esports yeah. to thrive. And I think there's a important point that you know there's a lot of things that we can consider esports, but it's not necessarily like what yeah. are we talking about with like popular esports, right? Uh, there's a lot of games out there that have had massive competitions for years, right? Like chess is a game that's been around for millennia, and mm-hmm. uh, there's big chess tournaments every year probably not the largest community that watches them even though there's a lot of players for those things right uh, i mean everything has a most competitive games have a competitive field uh my old teachers were hearts players that had a competitive field right uh but what's going to be making that mainstream like that's a big difference and like like you said it's got to have something competitive it's got to be something uh that has um some interest and excitement in it uh, something that's going to be feel different every game, uh, so it doesn't feel like I'm watching the same thing every time. Um, and it's that, like we were saying before, it's that access point. It's got to be something that uh, everybody feels like they can they can get in and and be a part of it. Because uh, there, th- we can have esports for anything, right? There's we can make a competition uh, for anything where uh, one player is playing against another player. Uh, it's just how exciting and how big that's going to get is going to be determined by the community and the interest of actually watching it. Yeah. yeah and I think another really big thing that you have to look at, too, is you ha- you 100% have to have the support of the developer um, mm-hmm. because, again, you have to be able to broadcast these matches. A lot of times they're going to be having prize pools. So you either have to have um, in the terms of service that you're allowed to do this or you have to have a direct agreement with the company. Um, I know Nintendo, I mean, there's a big Super Smash Bros. thing there, but Nintendo is notorious for on YouTube specifically flagging people's videos and demonetizing basically anything with their games in it. So it's really hard to build up a big esports community um, around that unless you have the licensing with Nintendo and stuff like that because they're so just bad with flagging their videos um, and not letting people monetize their games. Um, so you really do have to have the support from the developer to go anywhere with an eSport. Yeah, NBA 2K is another one of those. Um, they don't have any other... Cus- they don't have like a custom game mode that you can play with that's kind of like their competitive side. So they want to hog all the tournament support so there's no supporting amateur scene at all. And it's really hard to kind of develop something out that way and their rank system isn't that good. Go ahead, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Everybody's just got to... 
follow the Blizzard model. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Blizzard's taking games that, like, I, I find it strange a little bit that, you know, the Blizzard arena is so pop- as popular as it is. Um, but their their model for esports has been fantastic over the years. And it's only getting better. Yeah. yeah well, if there's um, no more thoughts on that, I think we're probably going to wrap it up. I'm just uh, clarify here. Nobody else has anything to say on any of the topics before. Um, Aaron, you want to check the tweets Good. right now? I just got a Snapchat from Elijah. His fire alarm is currently going off in his building. So, <laughs> oh, that's not good. <laughs> <at all. laughs> I don't, I don't know uh, if anybody's uh, looking at the Twitter. So we'll we'll just check that real fast before we go off. So <laughs> he's currently standing outside in the 20 degree <laughs> or yeah, 20 degree cold right now. So <laughs> looking at it right now. There's nothing else there. That I think that's gonna be it. Um. Pocky Panda again is asking if we'll add PUBG to the league anytime <laughs> soon. I guess we can branch out to that. What do we what do we think of PUBG so far? They're all playing it. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. think <laughs> I find it interesting that uh the I, I can't remember who published it, but it was an interview with the developers of PUBG and the mm-hmm. developers don't think that it's ready to be an esport just themselves like the world is ready for it but the developers yeah. know that it's not set up to be an esport yet like it's the greatest thing and it's the next new big thing but it i don't think it's ready for that space quite yet uh i think eventually it'll get there but when i'm gonna sit and watch a player sit in a thing you know is sit in a bush for five minutes before they move or do anything <laughs> yeah. you know i i think there's some very core flaws to it but also, you know, you have those moments where it's all, you know, one-on-one inside of a house, you know, a really high-intense action. Mm-hmm. But the majority of the game is a player by themselves trying not to get found. And this is, yeah. I think, yeah. where it's going to go to the style of where you watch, like, televised, like, fishing and that kind of stuff where the game's gone for so long and there's such a big period of time where there's nothing really going on where these casters are going to have to find a time or these commentators are going to have to find content to be able to talk about strategies look at other teams and locations <laughs> of these teams and really put it together and really be able to fill <clears> the <throat> gap and that's that's where i what i think of when i think of PUBG. if i try to relate it to a sport right now is yeah. something like fishing and something like that where you have a huge gap of time or nothing's going on so they got to really talk a lot of strategy you know they're gonna have mm-hmm. to look at where this team is relative to this team, if they're going to be potentially going for this location, if they're going to push to, say, school, they're going to push to, like, Rosnock, or it's going to be a lot of talking strategy versus when you look at Counter-Strike, where it's just constantly going over the action, talking about the action, very little analytical stuff until after the um, after the match. So I think that's really yeah. what's going to have to take. And, that, and that's hard because talking about strategy does not make good TV. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Why, one of the reasons why chess is probably not more popular on TV than it is. Right. It's a fantastic game. Great strategy. It's lasted millennia. But uh, if what you're doing most of the time is talking about what they could be doing instead of like them actually doing it, it's kind of boring to watch. Yeah. Yeah. I think the developer needs to do a little work. Um, I I think there could be like other things that they can incorporate it to make it really interesting to watch and to add you know, a different skill cap, especially when you start incorporating teams and stuff like that. Like, Mm -hmm. if there's a pre, like, thought out, like, you know, we're going to have spawns over here that are really intense at school and also down at Gotka, and they know where where the plane's going to be beforehand and stuff like that, and it's kind of already known where stuff is going to be and where where points of interest are, it'll be a lot more interesting. Even if, specifically on PUBG, even if you... uh, the, The absolute simplest solution right now would be to lessen the time reduce the amount of time that you have in each closure so that the c- circle mm-hmm. is closing even quicker so you really have to run around you have to loot and you have to go and it's going to push these teams together more quickly and you're going to have a lot more people in a smaller area than you do right now spread over the map so that could be the very simple solution i know you can do that in custom games i don't believe they do that at the moment um mm-hmm. in the few competitive landscapes that there are but that could be just the simplest option there yeah like just a simple addition like knowing where the drops are going to be that would add a huge amount of action there would be so much more yeah. fighting yeah. going on and stuff of interest like strategy going on around getting those to those drop zones you know just different things like that would add a huge skill cap to it and that goes back to developer support 
Exactly. Right? Exactly. They They're need to ready. know. They need to know what makes for a good, interesting match without losing the, um, that the core elements of the game. So. And also making it so you don't lag every two seconds. That would be great too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have a 1080 Ti, 4770K, and that game still eats so many resources in this computer. Yep. Then I can yeah. go run like a GTA 5 on Ultra. No problem while I'm streaming, and it's like, all right, that's fine. So there's definitely a lot of work to do on that game, and it it, it still is in beta. That's what a lot of people forget. It's um, it either just came out of beta or it's coming out of beta in the next update, but it is still a beta game, and people expect it to be like this massive esport. Um, and that's by the way one of the big, a couple of the big reasons we don't have it in HSEL for those watching. Um, I get we get the question for PUBG multiple times a day, every day, and we give them the same answer, you know. You can go fill out yeah. the form here. We'll look at it. But one of the big reasons we're not really looking at it right now is that, one, you have to have very specific licensing with the developer to be able to run tournaments where you have to pay to enter, um, which would qualify under us because you do have the $5 a month subscription. Um, and when you're giving away prizing, and PUBG right now doesn't have the a, an open license to be able to for anybody to run it. So yeah. there is reasoning to the games we have um, just in terms of – we need people to, who want to play it. Um, with PUBG, you have to have a lot of people who want to play it. Yeah. Um, it's like 100 people in each match. So you, we have to have a lot of people. We have to have licensing. We have to have the ability to set it up and run it where it's enjoyable. Well, oh, God, I bit my teeth. Enjoyable for people to watch. Um, so that's a reason we don't have a good majority of games that people ask us for, is those reasons. Yeah. Right, yeah, but if that is the end of social media i don't think there's anything in twitch chat that i've seen but um yeah if there, unless there's any other thoughts that's gonna be it guys thank you uh for coming out um this has been episode two if you guys do want to comment after the stream here you can use the hashtag hsel homeroom we'll try to reply to some tweets um we will maybe touch on stuff in the next episode again this is every friday night um again thank you guys for coming out um yeah <laughs> yeah thanks for having us thanks. it was good Yep, thanks right. for having me. All right, bye-bye.